Good evening. My name is uh, Dick Clay, and I'm the president and CEO of the Filson Historical Society. Thank you for being with us this evening uh, for the second uh, Theodore Sedgwick Distinguished Lecture Series. This is presented by the University of Louisville's Christina Lee Brown Envirome Institute in collaboration with the Filson Historical Society, and we are so grateful to you all for letting it letting us do this here at the Filson. It's, it's very meaningful. Um, yeah. Thank you. My wife is uh, on a trip with her 89-year-old father and her sister, and I'm picking her up tonight at 1215. When she arrives home, this will greet her uh, on our mantle as an arrangement. But I want to simply tell you about it briefly in case you didn't see it downstairs. Uh, Craig Caviar is, is Craig here? There he is. All right. Craig Caviar, of course, is the resident genius of Caviar Forge. And this is, or was, a gun. And it is now um, something that I will not use in the garden, considering what I paid for it. But it will be forever in our house. Um, Craig and I go back a long way in that his daughter and our son uh, dated all the way through high school. It's a plowshare. And that is something that we do here at the Filson. And we convert history into plowshares. Um, I want to tell you all about a lecture that we do have coming up early next week, or later this week, excuse me, this Thursday, September 14th at 6 p.m. I should know that because I'm reading the book. Uh, it's Tula Pendleton, The Life and Work of a Forgotten Southern Writer. Barbara Pendleton Jones takes on a journey of Tula Pendleton's remarkable life, uh, giving new generations the chance to discover the work of this extraordinary Southern uh, writer who spent her first 20 years of her life in Hartford, Kentucky, down near Rough River in, in Western Kentucky. Uh, visit Filson Historical for more information. If you have questions after that presentation, please use the mic. Um, and or after this presentation, please use the mic. We will have a mic up here for anybody who wants to come up and ask it. We've got an all-star crowd tonight, so we really do need for you to come up and ask any questions you might have after the lecture. Uh, now I want to turn this mic over to Dr. Aruni Bhatnagar. Well, thank you very much and welcome everybody to this evening, and we are very Proud and excited to have this lecture. I'm Aruni Bhatnagar from the University of Louisville, and I direct the Christina Lee Brown Envirome Institute. And at the Institute, we study of the different facets of what health is and how health is affected by our, our cultural, our, our economic, our financial, our uh, environmental, and spiritual well being. And so, in that vein, we have been uh, sort of alert to the idea that we need to understand the wider implications of what health could actually mean. We, at the university, and particularly in a hospital, treat people for their physical sickness. But this sickness uh, emanates from way in the distance past from living in social conditions which are unconducive. And so we, if we are serious about preventing disease and promoting health, we need to understand the deep uh, sort of causes of, of this sickness and, and this um, lack of well-being. And so we started on this journey trying to uh, materialize this new vision of health in which we would look at different forms of health and try and understand how they contribute to our, our well-being and to be able to then alter things positively to the better. And in order for us to do that, we thought that we should have a series of dialogues about things that we do not know about in medical school. We do not understand uh, things that happen widely in the society. So we that might be two years a year ago we launched the theater Sedwick city lecture of series and this series is uh to discuss wider social issues 
And we are so glad to have the Ambassador Sedwick here as our scholar in residence. And he is, uh, I'm sure many of you know him, is one of the sort of leading political figures in this country. He's been involved with lots of different political issues. But most importantly, he sort of embodies what it means to be a scholar and to be inquisitive and curious and know the world around us. And so to us, he has always been an inspiration. And I think that this lecture series sort of typifies that in which we can then be able to expand the way we think about health so that we will be able to appreciate, understand, and critique uh, our social conditions and social environments. And so we are really uh, proud to have this uh, series of lectures. This is number two, but we'll have a whole a range of those coming in the future. And so we're very excited and, and sort of honored that all of you are here. And we're particularly honored that uh, Ambassador Sedwick is here. And so I invite him here to the mic to introduce our speaker today. Well, thank you so much, Rooney. And uh, first of all, let me thank Dick Clay for hosting us tonight. You're, you're doing a splendid job here at the uh, Pilsen, and I'm honored to be able to present these lectures here, which is such a great uh, venue. And I appreciate, uh, yeah, that's good. Sure. And we have a lot of uh, distinguished guests here tonight that I want to recognize. Uh, Chief of Police, Gwen Villaroyal, where are you? And many of Louisville's finest are with, accompanying her tonight. Welcome, welcome all of you. And uh, needless to say, they're on the front lines in this issue. Uh, uh, President of Council, Metro Council, uh, Marcus Winkler is here with us tonight. Marcus, thank you for coming. I'm really happy to see the ladies from Moms Demand Action. And that's what it's going to take on this issue. It's going to take civic engagement. Um, and finally, I want to recognize the Dr. Gordon Tobin and the doctors who are here who uh, are doing a valiant job. Uh, many of them are just emotionally drained. Yeah. And the uh, head of GLI, Sarah Davis, or Davish, or Wisdom is here. Uh, Sarah, there you are. And I want to say that each of these constituents really represent a different aspect of what we're talking about tonight, because the worst, of course, the worst part of it are the victims themselves. But then, then you have to think about the um, doctors who have to deal with this. The civic crisis that this is causing and the police who are dealing with this so and the uh, business community how you, how can you attract businesses to come to a city that has this kind of uh, violence anyways um when rooney asked me to uh, attract some speakers to this lecture series i thought well what are the issues that are affect people here most of all and of course you know there's so many wonderful, positive things that I've learned about Louisville since I've been here for four years. But, you know, we have to confront the issue of, of uh, gun violence, which is not an issue just here, but across the country. And um, my, my friend Ryan Bussey wrote this great book called Gunfight, which I commend to all of you. And uh, he really chronicles how he worked in the firearms industry for 25 years and uh, he describes how the gun industry has kind of hijacked the debate about i used to be a member of the nra and the nra used to be about gun safety training people for gun safety it used to be about promoting conservation this kind of thing and it turned into a quite a radical extremist organization that has polarized the discussion on gun violence so uh, with that i'd like to turn it over to ryan and he has deliberately keeping his remarks fairly short, so because I know that you all will have a lot of questions for him going forward. Thank you, man.
I want to start by saying uh, when Ambassador Sedgwick asked me to come down to Louisville, sorry, I want to make sure I don't say say that incorrectly. The stewardess on the plane when I came down, I tried to explain to people like it's a one syllable town. Um, I don't want to put too many syllables in there. You'll know I'm a foreigner. But um, I've spoken about this book all across the country. Um, Todd assured me that this was the center of enlightenment. And I have to say from the audience here this evening, I'm very heartened to know how many book readers and lovers of knowledge there are in this great town. And the, the it's been so warm and beautiful to be here. So thank you so much for welcoming, welcoming me. I, this is me. I grew up on a rural ranch, probably uh, 20 miles from pavement, 60 miles from the nearest fast food restaurant or theater. Many of the best days of my life were spent with guns, hunting and shooting with my grandfather, my brother, my friends. And so for me, the cultural connection to guns um, was really quite positive. The sort of divisive, angry, dangerous connection that so many in our country now experience with guns did not, it did not really resonate with me as a kid. This is, this is not me as a kid. This is me last year uh, with my, with my one of my bird dogs, Ted. He's named after Teddy Roosevelt. Um, I have another dog, Aldo Leupold. Um, but I, this is what I love to do. So, so many of, you know, the touchstone positive places in my life have been spent in and around guns. I, um, when I get out in nature, I like to spend time with my family. This is my wife, Sarah, my son's badge and lander. And I show you all this to let you know where I sit before I tell you where I stand. I'm a gun owner. I, I don't know how many guns I own. I think it's a, a, you know, two or three dozen. Sarah's pissed that I don't know that number. I, she said I should know it exactly because it sounds irresponsible, but I really don't know how many I own. I know the safe is full. I know that I like to spend time with my boys. I know that shooting and hunting and time around guns can and is a positive thing for so many people in this country. And I know that the gun culture in this country is out of control and it's one of the most dangerous things facing our democracy. I spent 25 years in the firearms industry, and actually, that's not true. I spent 25 years and four days, and yes, I was counting the last four days. Um, I left at the peak of my career, the peak of my earning potential. If I would have had an executive coach, they would have told me to do exactly the opposite of what I did. I left, I left as an executive when I was 50 years old. That was a couple of years ago. Um, I left because I could no longer stomach what my industry was propagating across this country. Um, it was a dream job for me. You know, it wasn't unlike a kid who plays baseball, who then gets into the major leagues and finds himself on the mound. Um, I played baseball as a kid, um, but the norms and resp of responsibility and decency, as imperfect as they were in the first years of, of my career were upheld by the firearms industry, much like our norms of decency and responsibility in our political world were upheld 18, 19, 20 years ago. We didn't used to tweet out um, pictures from one sitting congressman about joking about killing another sitting member of Congress. That now is apparently one of the norms that we have established. Much like in my industry, um, I'm responsible for selling almost 3 million guns. None of them are AR-15s. I never participated in the sort of irresponsible, toxic advertising that is now commonplace. I refuse to go along with the sort of hatred and division and conspiracy that is now driving so much of our firearms um, culture and so much of our politics. I believe that we could have freedom and also have responsibility. We just needed to balance them. And I'm sad to say, I think our national balance is way, way, way out of whack. Um, things started to change for me in about 2005 or six. Um, by 2010, 
the industry was engaging in this sort of advertising. This is what's referred to as the man card campaign. Here tonight, I'm gonna to show you some things like this that are disturbing. Uh, they're painful, but they're real. Anybody can find, nothing I show you here this evening is in any way secret. It's not hidden. You can find, don't search for it on your internet browser because it will screw up your internet um, search algorithms and you will get all sorts of shit on your, on your search that you don't wanna see. So just trust me, you can find it. Um, but I want, if you would just read quickly through the card there, this is the man card campaign. This was um, propagated by Bushmaster Firearms. This is in 2010. And if that, if that little card there on the right, the man card campaign that you would get when you purchase this firearm doesn't sort of foreshadow this sort of angry, divisive, in-your-face politics that we would see by 2016, I really don't know what does. And that's one of the through lines of my book is that everything that we experience in our politics, our divided families, our divided workplaces, the hatred we seem to have for each other, the embrace of conspiracy and untruth and racism, it started with these kind of campaigns. I think I lived in the industry that wound this all up. And I think we're going to have to unwind it if we wish for it to be any better. Sadly, this was the exact gun that was used in December 2012 in a school in Connecticut called Sandy Hook. And for, the NRA, and for a while after that happened, the NRA was silent about this, as is the model. When something horrible like that happens, of course, we never want to capitalize on the emotion of the moment, so say a Wayne LaPierre, we, the time is not right, right? It's never, it's never right. I've got one word for that, that's bullshit. Um, the time is right to capitalize on that sort of tragic event. And we better get better at capitalizing on that sort of emotion or you're gonna see a lot more of those days. In fact, seven days after that event, Wayne LaPierre gave his famous good guy with a gun speech, meaning, the problem isn't that we have too many guns like this, it's that we don't have enough. We need more people with guns in places like that. My kids were the same age as those kids in Sandy Hook when that happened. I have two boys now, they're 15 and 18. Christy wanted me to mention as an aside, the, uh, the climate, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of just like a um, celebrity father following around my kids because they're the two of the lead plaintiffs in the big climate case that you might've heard of. Um, they recently won the climate case in Montana. It's, it's not every day that your kids ask you, Dad, can I use your computer to get on with CNN? I'm like, hey. Also, M MSNBC later tonight. Like, and, and Dad, can we give you an autograph? Like, okay, that's enough. Um, but after this happened, I was about ready to witness what would happen if an issue was elevated to one where one side of the aisle could drive divisive politics, anger, hatred, to a place that could jeopardize our country. And it accelerated. Things happened that I fought against. I, I note many of these in the book. And um, what I wanna impart to you now is that what the country is facing with regards to an impending political and social crisis, I need to let you know it's very urgent. There are marketing forces and um, sort of commercial forces that have been spun up by the NRA and have now been captured by the industry that are creating very, very deleterious impacts to our country. And if you don't believe that, here's a 2018 ad. This was a big wallpaper ad at the SHOT Show. The SHOT Show is one of the largest trade shows in the world. It's the shooting, hunting, outdoor trade show. And actually, these days, it doesn't have a lot to do with outdoor trade. It has a lot to do with militarizing firearms. Um, 15 years ago, the firearms industry would not allow tactical gear to be displayed at its own trade shows. These were not laws. They were voluntary norms of prohibition. The, this was the industry that I got into, the sort of dream job that I thought as a, I had as a kid. But by 2018, Every booth everywhere 
displayed every kind of tactical gear and these sort of incendiary ads. This is from this is from Spikes Tactical. It's an AR-15 maker out of Miami, Florida. Um, and I, the, the important thing about this to me is that it's 2018. This is two years prior to the so to the sort of source, social angst we saw in 2020. And if you don't think that advertising has an impact, once you look, these guys are all have T-shirts, jeans, backwards ball caps, AR-15s. Fast forward two years. Kyle Rittenhouse, Kenosha, Wisconsin, backwards ball cap, T-shirt, jeans, AR-15. The marketing could not be more direct than that. This is not something that is happening to our country. This is something that our country is doing to ourselves. It's important to pause here and note that this is indeed something we have chosen as a country. It's a, if, you, if you put together a system to elicit certain outcomes and you're half good at putting together the system, which the NRA has been, those outcomes will, will arrive. And we're now at a place where the firearms industry understands that propagating the sort of hatred and conspiracy is good for business. And if you don't believe that, here's a magazine cover from just a couple years ago where after the angst of 2020, you see, this is obviously good for business. Now, I always joke because I don't know what the gal in the back with the katana is doing. She doesn't appear to be a Japanese warrior, but perhaps she is. Um, the photog on this needed to do some editing, perhaps. Um, I've been a sales executive. I've been a marketer. And I'm telling you right now, it's tough to look away from the sort of explosive sales results that happen when you know that angst, that hatred, that conspiracy, that racism in a society will create positive sales outcomes. It's tough to look away from that. You're like, really? The sales charts are up? We need a little more hatred, conspiracy. We market towards it. Wouldn't it be good? And so typically, a Democratic president would be a sales boom for firearms companies and a Republican president would be a sales bust for firearms companies. But in the case of Donald Trump, it was the opposite. Why? He knew how to put hatred and conspiracy and racism on steroids. The same industry that once would not allow tactical gear to be displayed in its own trade shows now has 500 or more companies, all with social media posts like this. This took me a grand total of, I don't know, two minutes perusing um, tactical gear companies. These are just social media posts. Um, this is the sort of bulletproof vest. And, and again, you couldn't even display this in the industry's own trade shows. I know, I was there. And if you wonder who we're um, appealing to, troubled young men, this is the same sort of tactical gear social media posts that the Buffalo, that the racist Buffalo shooter talks about perusing in his manifesto. He wants to know what bulletproof vest to buy, what helmet, what goggles. And again, where we had no companies, would it be allowed by the industry to display? Again, not a law. It's a voluntary norm of self, self-regulation. Now we have 500 of these companies competing. The second one over combines all sorts of um, domestic terror images. We have the Boogaloo Boys. We have the Proud Boys. Um, those are all images in there. And then we have, obviously, scantily clad women appealing to troubled young men. Um, if we doubt who we're trying to appeal to and why so many of these shooters peruse these sort of social media posts, here it is. This is the system. I know we have a lot of doctors in here. Um, this is just like cranking out the Big Macs, right? You're going to have a bad, you're going to have a bad health outcome if you do this. So I, it, it's really, really important to note, I think, that no law, no change in law, no change in administration necessarily allowed this to happen. This was a breakdown in voluntary norms. The industry once knew not to do this. Now it proudly does it. Why? Because there is profit in it. And once it starts down the profit road, there's almost no place to stop. Um, here you have a Daniel Defense ad 
Daniel Defense, basically in this ad, use what they use, right? So when um, you often see now firearms advocacy groups say that these are not military weapons, well, right here you have a company that sprung up. Prior to 2009, Marty Daniel, who owns this company, sold garage doors. That's what he did. Now this company is worth about $200 million. They sell AR-15s. They built their company by overtly advertising that any kid can be a special forces operator simply by buying or using what they use. And if you doubt the power of that, here's the social media post that was up the day of Uvalde. This was the gun that was used in the Uvalde shooting. This is a Daniel Defense DD4 M7. Um, there's a Proverbs verse there above that post that was up on Twitter and Instagram. The shooter in Uvalde purchased this gun through the mail. It was delivered to a gun store. He did a background check, took him about eight minutes. He left the store with this gun. A couple days later, he marched into Uvalde. The school was 78 high capacity 30 round magazines, 78. It's legal for him to purchase containers full, containers, semi trucks full of those 30 round magazines. If you think there may be a limit to the degree to which this sort of hatred and conspiracy may be used to drive firearms marketing, I give you rooftop arms. As you know, the July 4th shooting in Illinois at the parade was carried out by a troubled kid who jumped up on a rooftop and shot people at the parade. And you see there, that's an image of a Virginia firearms rally where you have the kid in the back there. He has, it's tough to see, but the, if you zero in on it, that black, uh, that black jacket has a moniker on it where he proudly proclaims that he is a rooftop voter. A rooftop voter in firearms vernacular is somebody who is disappointed with election outcomes and jumps up on a rooftop and votes with their AR-15. So to satisfy that sort of consumer demand, we have a company who has sprung up called Rooftop Arms. And if you're dismayed by this, Good. You should be. Um, this is the sort of thing that we are facing. This is the sort of thing that happens to society in res when responsibility is jettisoned. If you worry about how bad it may get and how suggestive marketing may get, I give you the ever so subtle urban super sniper. Now, I am just a ranch kid, but I don't think I have to think too hard about what I'm supposed to do with an urban super sniper. I think you kind of see where I'm going here. Um, none of this, none of these things that have happened in the last eight to 10 years are surprising to me. There are things that have been designed and primed by a system to elicit these sort of outcomes. When January 6th happened, I was editing my book. I knew it was coming out. Many people in the industry, nobody in the industry knew it was coming out. I called some folks. I was very distressed. And one of the executives I called said, as the news was on, it was ongoing. I was seeing police officers being beaten. I was seeing the pepper spray. I was seeing, eventually would see somebody who I've come to know and respect very much very much Michael Fanon being pepper sprayed and tasered. And the firearms executive I called said, well, at least they know what it's like to be at an NRA show now. And if you doubt that, here's some marketing from Patriot Ordnance, an AR-15 maker. These are actual marketing images that somewhere, some troubled 20-year-old kid is looking at these thinking, I too can be a January 6th warrior. Again, January 6th and not just, it wasn't just thrust upon our country. It's a product of a system that we established and are propagating. There are now groups on the right 
I'm warning you, and I know some of you have mentioned to me and are probably taking some solace in the fact that the NRA has had some financial difficulties, and they have, but what has spun out of the demise of the NRA is much more frightening than the NRA itself. And these sort of groups where the NRA used to depend upon and profit off the system, these sort of groups want to blow up the system. And they want to empower every kind of toxic masculinity that you can imagine. And they really celebrate and never shy away from even the most lowbrow sort of toxic masculinity and marketing, even this sort of marketing for a silencer. Now, I see this and I laugh and I think, how stupid can you be to think this is in some way tasteful marketing? Um, it's a suppressor company or a silencer. Obviously, subtleness is not their key. You have Donald Trump Jr. speaking to the owner over there, a very proud supporter of this company. Now, after all that, I'm sure you're invigorated and feeling great about this evening. Um, but there are there are a lot of positive signs, and a lot of them have to do with how how extreme this is. And I'd like to give you just a bit of hopefulness here before I send you away with three bottles of wine that you're going to sit around your house and drink yourself silly tonight. Um, when I wrote my book, knowing that this sort of culture exists, um, I was worried about my kids going to a public school in a very red, gun-friendly part of the country. I was worried about my wife, Sarah, and I. Some of you have kindly come up to me and mentioned Sarah. For those of you who read the book, you know, yes, yes, I married way over my head. Yes, she's the hero of the book. Um, we were worried about snipers above our house on the hill. We were worried about our digital safety. We thought we would be deluged. I don't know how we pushed send on the final draft and it still happened, having those fears, but we did it. And um, actually the opposite happened. Yeah, I get a little ugliness. I mean, anybody who follows me on Twitter or you know, social media, they see some of the ugliness, but that's not the majority of it. Almost every morning I get up, I click on my author email, and right after the book came out, there would be 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 of these. I know they're not from the wing nuts because they're grammatically correct and spelled properly. But they're heartfelt. They're long. They're from people from West Texas or West Virginia. They're from right of center people and center left people and gun owners and military members, and daughters who don't understand how their dad went off the deep end, and, 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 and. There is a vast majority of frustrated, common, decent people out there who need a voice, who are disgusted by this, and who are looking for somebody or something or some movement to stand up and give them a voice. And we must do it. We must do it. If we don't, I'll tell you that the leading domestic terror orgs in the country will. Here we have three of them. The three percenters, you notice the disarm in there? You have the Proud Boys down there. Actually, I take a lot of pleasure. That dude in that picture is in prison for 22 years. Um, Could have been 44 or 66, but I'll take 22. You have the Oath Keepers with a picture of the guy with the guns. In other words, this issue is at the very center of the threats to our democracy. It's larger, as horrific as all of the gun violence impacts are that we experience and are dismayed by. It's larger than that. It, this is about our democracy. We're not going to fix any of those issues if we don't figure out how to improve this one. The firearms industry is working hard to make sure that dedicated people like you don't succeed. Here is an ad from Black Rain Ordinance. And yes, the acronym for that is BRO. Um, 
but this is a three percenter rifle, right? Marketed directly to a domestic terror org. This is page eight and nine of their current catalog. Lastly, I'll say it's an urgent situation. The work you're doing is incredibly important. And I need you to know how important it is. This was a new company launched last year at the SHOT Show. This is We One Tactical, as in Little One Tactical, Little Kid Tactical. And there you have the JR-15 instead of the AR-15. Um, I don't really want to end on that kind of low note, but I'm going to because I want to I want to open it up, as Todd said, I want to open it up to questions. I've found that the questions elicited from this sort of <clears throat> night are usually more valuable than what I have to say. And I'm here as a resource to you. I want to, I mean, I know I'm kind of like a circus animal, like that dude was in the firearms business. Like, let's poke through the cage and see if he's real. Um, and so I'm here as a resource to you. If you, there is no question you can't ask. There's no dumb question. Um, there's no question too small or too big, so I'm here. Thank you. Ryan, thank you so much. That was a really powerful uh, evening of uh, discussion. So uh, who would like to come up and ask some questions? Neville, why don't you start? Come on up to the mic. Uh, if you would. Working? Yeah, I was thinking, um, thought of uh, gun makers that somebody my age, is this thing working? Yeah. Okay, would know. And these names are Winchester, Remington, Smith & Wesson, Colt, Ruger, Kimber, Armalite, Springfield, Mossberg. Federal, I think, only makes ammo. I never heard of Daniel Defense or Rooftop Arms. Uh, the European countries I could think of are H. Heckler and Koch, uh, Sig Sauer, Fabrique Nationale, Mauser, Glock, and so on. Leaving out the English shotgun makers and all that. Who owns the American companies these days? And Mo where and where do companies like uh, Daniel Defense and Rooftop Arms get their money to capitalize? Second second question. Yep. Uh, <laughs> where are the women? <laughs> there's no there's no women shown in any of these ads. And the third question is, what was that shotgun you were carrying? I think it's a European 20-gauge double, but I'm not sure. Geez, you're loading them up. Um, so let's start something near and dear to my heart. That shotgun is a 1912 A.H. Fox built in Philadelphia back in the golden age of American shotgun bird gun building. And uh, I restocked it myself with an English stock because Americans stupidly thought that we knew how to build a bird gun. We didn't. Um, we knew how to build the steel on it. So I put a stock on it. And it's, so it's a half English gun, half 19. All the steel on that was built in 1912. I take a lot of solace in that, carrying around a hundred and what now, 11-year-old shotgun, which I was uh, shooting with my boy um, Sunday before I came here. Who owns the firearms companies? Almost all of them are small family-owned um, companies. Daniel Defense, by the way, Daniel Defense with those sort of marketing activities was not chastised in any way by the um, firearms industry. Marty Daniel was appointed to a very prestigious seat on the firearms industry board of governors. So he is one of the leading, he's been appointed, anointed as one of the industry leaders. There are two publicly traded companies, Ruger and Smith and Wesson. Um, Smith and Wesson sold for $15 million total. The entire value of the company was $15 million in the year 2000. Their market cap in 2018 was 1.69 billion. Um, what was your, your second? There was a third question. They're kind of like the trees in Western Kansas. There aren't any. Um, there are very few, although uh, marketing to women and people of color has increased rapidly as our soda sort of social angst has increased around um, 2020 and the time after that. So that that is a increasing segment of the market. Hi, I have not had a chance to read your book and you may have addressed this, but 
Uh, you mentioned that advertising has an impact. I've always wondered about Hollywood and the video games and the impact that they have. I know it's considered a small percentage. I've had discussions with people about this, but in the big scheme of things, Hollywood has a big impact because people watch television. I watch these shows or these promotions that belittle police people. And I just wanted to know what your, because you talk about propagating, what, if that isn't a way to propagate crime where kids are on videos and talk and, and shoot people and also Hollywood continually promotes movies and shooting people. Yeah. So we shouldn't pretend that this issue in a complex society like ours is a simple thing. It's not a simple thing. We're not going to, and I often speak to gun violence prevention groups and I will get a question such as how can we solve this? We're not going to solve this. Hopefully what we do is do what normal, decent citizens in a democracy do. You work to make things better instead of work to make things worse. Um, as far as Hollywood goes, and that's part of the complexity in video games, um, of course there's violence in video games and in Hollywood. I will say before you listen to many firearms companies who like to blame Hollywood and video games, just know that there are marketing departments because I've been in them who work very hard to get their guns placed in video games and movies so that they can sell more of them. So when, when in fact, there is a famous, another famous Daniel Defense social media post where they're celebratory about the fact that their DD M4 V7 was placed in Call of Duty. And as the lead title page, you see the guy back to the camera, Daniel Defense rifle, Daniel Defense post this, celebratory post and it's known that the uvalde shooter not only did he buy a daniel defense rifle he played call of duty where the daniel defense rifle was placed so firearms companies want to blame uh video games and movies but they work to place their guns into video games and movies because it sells firearms so it's a complex thing and we shouldn't think that flipping one switch is going to fix all this it ain't right even if even if we could institute 20 new policies that we all want to institute, we're still, we're still going to have these complex problems in democracy. The question is, do we want to have more of them or less of them? Um, yeah, I just want to thank you so much for what you've done. I already spoke to you a little bit earlier. Um, and for the person that wanted to know where the women are, a lot of us are in Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. Um, yeah, um, my name is Kathy Hobart, and I'm the um, chapter leader for the state of Kentucky. And my question for you, Mr. Bussey, is um, I don't, I know it's complex and we can't solve this problem, but in a state like Kentucky, what would you recommend that a group like ours, where do we start? Well, if I knew that, I would, uh, I'd be making the big bucks as a political consultant. I'm not doing that. I'm, uh, hauling away all this cash I have from the being an author. That's a joke. Um, I think this, this issue, you have to start with what's common sense and we all agree on, right? We're still trying to close the gun show loophole, even after 1999 in Columbine. The gun show loophole led to Columbine, our first really huge, notable national mass shooting that happened in 1999. I write about it in my book. And yet we still have the gun show loophole open, which essentially allows many guns to be purchased without benefit of a background check. Um, I was speaking to somebody else here this evening. Background checks poll generally between 80 and 85 percent and have since 1995. And as I mentioned to whoever I was talking to, ice cream does not poll at 85 percent, right? We have something that polls at 85 percent, yet we have the tyranny of the majority or minority that prevents us from doing something sensible. Would Universal background checks solve everything. No, of course it wouldn't. Um, but it would solve some. Another thing that has been proposed is raising the minimum age of purchase to, of semi-automatic rifles to 21. It's currently 18. Would that solve everything? No. 
would have solved Buffalo, would have solved Uvalde. Kid and Uvalde bought the gun the day after his 18th birthday. Um, Buffalo was a few months after. Um, and several others are like that. My point here is, is that there's no, there's no fail safe switch here, but there are things, common sense things that gun owners, Todd and I are both gun owners, nobody, no reasonable person thinks that these things are unreasonable. And these are the things where we should start, find agreement and push and reestablish these sort of, sort of social norms before they get away from us. Um, if I could just say one thing, um, currently um, there is a, a rule change that's being proposed by the um, president um, directing the um, director of ATF, um, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosives to change the rule defining what is a gun seller that will, if this rule was to be passed without having to change any laws, the gun show loophole and the online loophole will be closed because it would define a gun seller as anyone who sells guns for profit. And obviously you don't go to the gun show to sell guns if you're not gonna make a profit at it. You don't sell them online if you're not gonna make a profit at it. So these people would all be required to do background checks. That the line is currently open for us to register our opinion about whether that's a good rule for us to pass or not. And you can be sure that the opposition is deluging that line every day with their opinion about it. But 85% of us at least think that's a good idea. So, um, you know, you just need to find out about that. Talk to me afterwards if you want to know how to get in touch. Go to everytown.org um, and just click on the ATF stuff. You'll find it. Just click around. You'll find it if you know how to use Google. <laughs> so. Also, if anybody doubts that moms are kick-ass community organizers, I want you to go talk to Kathy. I'm concerned about why the young people think the only way they can solve a problem is to kill them. It really is a problem. Well, that's why I'm so concerned with this marketing. I think that social license, like no company spends millions of dollars on marketing and social media accounts if they think it's not going to have an impact. Otherwise, why do you do it, right? Um, and for us to provide the sort of social license where we essentially tell troubled young men, mostly troubled young men, because that's mostly who commits these sort of activities, for us to essentially allow companies to tell them that this is the way to solve your problems or gain your manhood, it's a damn dangerous situation. I mean, I'm really not as sad and horrible as all of these things are, including the situation here in town. I'm having lived inside of these if this industry, I'm not shocked by them. I'm a little shocked it doesn't happen more often. But I think absent action, it is going to happen more often. So there was a time in the 1950s when we had the same issue with the tobacco industry. They were killing more people than you can think of, 300,000 people a year. 50% of the people were smoking. And there was no way of, of getting to the tobacco lobby because they were intractable. And they had so much power on the hill. It is somewhat, isn't it, parallel to what the gun industry and the gun lobby is now. And so we have been able to make a radical change in the tobacco use in terms of by taxation, by changing social norms, by changing laws. Tobacco 21 just passed and it was because of things uh, that we have done in the last few years. Why is the gun issue so intractable? And do you see any hope that learning the lessons from tobacco regulation that we might in some time in the future make a headway? So that's an excellent question. And I um, I speak about this some in my book, but in, in October of 2005, George W. Bush signed a law called, which is now goes by the acronym PLACA, which is Protection and Lawful Commerce and Arms Act. That act provides a broad liability shield to the firearms industry and was patterned after um, an, an attempt by the NRA to shield companies from the exact sort of tobacco litigation that we just heard about. And so the industry watched, and I was in the middle of this, the industry watched as big tobacco 
was sued essentially through public nuisance laws by mayors across, largely by mayors across the country. <clears throat> the tobacco industry eventually was brought to the table, even though, you know, we've all seen, I'm guessing, the line of tobacco ex executives lined up testifying to Congress where they say, I don't believe it causes cancer. And you're you know, like, dude, I mean, come on. Um, the firearms industry was terrified about that. And so PLACA was passed. George W. Bush signed it. Wayne LaPierre said it was the most significant firearms legislation in his lifetime, which is correct. And it provides a broad liability shield against that prohibits um, federal, federal and most state action from um, suing uh, firearms companies for this sort of activity. Again, it's something we've created. This, this is not gravity. It wasn't thrust upon us. This is not some law of physics. This is not something that's intractable or we, you know, can't change. Um, to Christy's point about creating health systems, these are choices we make. Choices have outcomes. These are the outcomes. Hello, my, my name is Sandy D'Souza. I'm from UOF. Hello, I've been in this country for 30, 38 years. I'm still an Australian citizen. Australia and my neighbor, New Zealand, has some of the highest gun uh, guns uh, ownerships. And yeah. let's speak about New Zealand. New Zealand has the highest guns ownership in the entire world. Four million people, I don't know how many, but let's say. But yet they have the lowest gun violence in the world. Yeah. This is a country, US. Do they have Mitch McConnell? <laughs> U.S., I'm, after being 38 years, I'm still an Australian citizen, original from India. In New Zealand, you know, they, uh, they have the lowest, you know, and U.S. is always imposing their values on other countries. Yet we have 50,000 people, children dying in this country every year. We have surgeons, we have medical professionals. What's the, the immense cost of this in this country? Yeah. We don't even talk about it. Yet we don't want to learn about this from other countries. Yeah. What is your solution? Well, this is, this is kind of my point. There, there are a lot of folks who believe in American exceptionalism. I'm one of those, but exceptionalism is not a one-way track. It's it's a um, it's a burden to carry, and we're letting down our citizens by not doing the hard work of improving this instead of worsening it. And I think um, your example, and I'm not familiar with all that. I am I'm familiar generally with firearms ownership in Australia, and New Zealand. You're right; it's high. I don't know what the what the figures are, but there are obviously other societal pressures and inputs um, other than just firearms ownership. For instance, Switzerland has a very high, very high firearms ownership, yet we have very little firearms um, violence in Switzerland. And it's because we have a heavy permitting process. We have safety classes that are taught. Um, everybody who owns the firearms in Switzerland every two or three years has to renew their safety classes and their competence. And so I think, this goes to the idea, I told somebody else here today, I have a friend that often says, you can have anything you want, you just can't have everything you want, right? So we can have a lot of freedom and we can want a country like we have, but we may not be able to have it if we don't balance it with responsibility. So we've got to, ha we've, we've got to have both of those and I think we're out of balance. Well, I can tell you that Australia 
has a population of 24 million. The gun violence death is about 100 per year. New Zealand has a population of 4 million. Gun violence death is only 10 a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. And this country saves 50 million children every year. And the cost of medical, you know, isn't that of saving them you know, the, of an ER that costs probably $100,000 for a gunshot? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Ryan, thanks so much. I, I love your story. I, I love what you're doing and keep it up. Uh, Thank you. We need, we, we need more of it. Um, my name is Ted, Ted Nixon and I am board chair of a local organization. You said, what can we do locally? A uh, local organization called No I'm sorry. A local organization called No More Red Dots, uh, founded by Dr. Eddie Woods. And we really focus on eliminating particularly the shootings, West and 9th Street, Smoketown are largely um, minority neighborhoods. Um, our focus is more on the people because what you're doing is like this, but mm -hmm. we figure we can make a difference. So it's um, we have now 12 interventionists full-time on the streets every day, um, working with the gangs, working with different people, but particularly working with youth. Uh, we, have a, we have an organization called Operation Hope, where we try and take youth who are focused on violence. Uh, we're the only organization, I think, in Louisville that actually works with active shooters. Mm -hmm. We have active 55 active shooters now in our um, mentee program. Uh, they've come to us from the Department of Juvenile Justice and JCPS. Uh, and so far, knock wood, we've had no recidivism uh, because we're trying to show them another way, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be peace through the arts, peace through sports, peace through construction, different different things that we do. So I guess, you know, my, my question would be um, uh, your thoughts on, okay, what do we need to do to work with the people who have the guns, particularly? So CVI, Community Violence Intervention, which is what you're discussing, right. hugely, hugely important. Right. Um, you're doing God's work there. That's amazing yeah. hard work. Thank you. Um, and I don't want to, I definitely do not want to minimize, I just can't even hardly believe that there's any more important, critical, on the ground, impactful work and hard work that somebody is doing than what you guys are doing. I will say, I, I just like, I just think we should try to build a system yeah. that makes it less necessary. Totally agreed. Yeah. I mean, you're right. And, you know, we'd like to do more. We have 55 yeah. mentees. The sad thing is our youngest mentee who came from DJJ now is 12 years old. Yeah. He was an active shooter. And it's just, you know, it's it's a little unbelievable. But if you can hopefully work with them and turn them around and if anybody wants to know more about No More Red Dots, I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for doing what you're doing. Our chief of police was here earlier. I hope she's here now. We're very Many of us are very hopeful that she can untangle some of the serious problems that we have. And I have often wondered what it's like for police and cops to, to get embroiled in all these horrible, horrible gun issues that they deal with frontline every day. And anything that you might say at all about that is appreciated. Thank well, you. I'm not a, I'm not an LEO. Um, I know we have several here. Um, like they have to deal with this, um, and the fact that the fact that we send so many of our best officers into into harm's way every day with increasingly well armed assailants, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not fair to our cops. It's not fair. It's I, I don't know why we stand for it. Why we would purposefully make their lives and their job harder when they're trying to make our streets and our community safer. I don't, I, I just don't understand it. I'm Dr. Garrett Adams. I'm a retired pediatric infectious disease specialist. And when I see the 
gun violence data, which shows that it doesn't matter if we develop new vaccines and we new treatments, if we are letting our kids be killed by guns and they're scoring faster and higher, but especially assault weapons and tell me what can we do? Can we not ban assault weapons? And what is the pathway to that? So I think this is a excellent question. And I um, it's important here from a policy perspective, from a realistic policy perspective to understand what the reality of this is. The United States had an assault weapons ban from September 13th, 1994. That was the day Bill Clinton jumped up on a stage and signed it to September 13th of 2004, which is the day that George W. Bush allowed it to expire because it had a sunset provision in it. During those 10 years, it was not illegal to purchase, build, or sell AR-15s, AK-47s. I could have, I was in the industry then, I could have built and sold hundreds of them, thousands of them, truckloads of them. It was illegal, the assault weapons bill defined an assault weapons as, as an AR-15 with this list of additional features. But important to note, this feature-based thing that we call an assault weapons ban did not ban assault weapons. What it did, something it did do, which is very powerful, was codify a societal prohibition, a societal norm, which was adopted by the industry. The industry could have propagated, could have sold boatloads of these things. They couldn't have put a flash suppressor on them. They couldn't have put an accessory rail on them. But still, I could show all of you a pre-ban AR-15 and a post-ban AR-15. And other than the guys in blue back there, there ain't many of you that could tell the difference. And so um, my point here is, is that social norms and voluntary responsibility is as if not more important than these laws that we worry about. I know because we were once there, it wasn't very long ago. So I'll stop there. Well, let's give Ryan a great hand. I know uh, Kentucky has quite a history in alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. And uh, so in that context, Christy and I have invited the director of the ATF, the, alcohol, the Office of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, to come here. Uh, I haven't gotten a response. I can't guarantee, but we're hopeful that he would will come here and talk about some of those issues that uh, Moms Demand Action talked about, where what can we do in an executive capacity. I know that office was blocked by the gun industry for eight years before anyone could fill it, before Steve was able to be finally confirmed by the Senate by one vote. And so that just shows you the power that the industry has on the Hill still, even after all the scandals and all the corruption it's just amazing what influence they, they still have. It's improbable. But thank you all so much for coming, and it's been a great discussion. Thank you for your questions.